that takes care of that. All right, now let's uh, let's take our Bibles, if you would please. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter seven. Proverbs chapter seven. We're going to read verses six through thirteen of Proverbs chapter seven. For at the window of my house, I look through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black, in the dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with a tire of an harlot and a subtle of heart. Now she is, oh, let's see, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets and lieth and wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him. I'm going to stop before we go any further than that. Now, uh, I have been teaching on Wednesday nights uh, recently on, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren, speaking to Satan's devices. Uh, we just finished up uh, his, you know, dividing and division. Uh, that's, that's definitely a tactic that he uses. But we're going to enter into another, uh, another one of his devices tonight, and that is in the area of defilement. Defilement. Now, it's one thing, uh, and, you know, that's, that's one of his jobs. He is a great divider. He is a great defiler. And uh, think about that's exactly what he did. He, divi he divided even the angels in heaven. His division started in heaven itself in the presence of God. And then, of course, he defiled mankind because he also divided them from what God had said. He has a different tactics that he uses, but we're going to be Focusing on this one uh, this evening on the subject of defilement as his devices. So his devices are things that are knowable to the believer. Paul said we are not ignorant of his devices. So we know these things. If we're not ignorant of something, that means we have knowledge of it. So uh, we have knowledge that he uses division. We have knowledge that he is seeking to defile, uh, he's also seeking to destroy. And, you know, that's, that's the purpose that he comes with. He never comes with uh, anything that's going to profit you. He's not going to come to you with anything that's, that's good for you. Now, it may actually seem good at the time because that's how he gets you. He makes it look good. No, you know, he doesn't present all the, the, the tragedy and the, and the horror uh, and, and all of the things and, and ending up without God uh, in, in, in the lake of fire. He doesn't present all that. He presents everything good, what you're being robbed of, what looks good to you. It will look good. Now, if you think about the advertisements of the world on products that we shouldn't be taking on and taking in as Christians, they make it look appetizing, don't they? They make it look good. They make it look appearing that it would be something that would be good. That's exactly what they do. The devil, and he will take knowledge and he will make it look good to you. So that you're going to go, nobody, nobody sends it. If, if you know a fish isn't going to bite on a certain thing, you're not going to, you're not going to throw that lure out because it's not going to work. 
you're going to throw something appetizing, something that moves just the right way that triggers a response from the fish, whether it's something they can smell or something they want to take a bite of or something that just catches their eye and that, ooh, you know, and they and they zone in. You can watch them. Being a fisherman all my life, I've I've gotten to watch the reactions of some of the fish just before they they they, they took hold uh, of what I threw out there. And you can see the way they look at it. You can see, and they market stuff to make it look good to the fish. They want the fish to have that lure to look just like a fish, to move like a fish. Only it's got problems for the fish. Right about the place where the fish would just like to take a little bite. And the next thing you know, he's got a treble hook in his face. And he's on the line. And his life is now on the line. That's what Satan does. He wants to make it look good. So that you're drawn in. What does the Bible say? That that a man, you know, when he when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Right? That's that's what it talks about. It talks about it when we're when we're getting ready to go that way, that we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. The more it looks good, the more you want it. Just like my mom's banana pudding. Amen right there. Oh, mercy and her cheesecake. If you never had that, you've just not lived. There's always room for it. It's so light and fluffy. I don't care how, how much you've stuffed yourself. You can get some cheesecake down. And it's all right. But it looks so good. That's what he does. But see, we're not ignorant. We're not unaware of what he, the tactics that he uses. But it's important for us to talk about him. It's important for us to put it in an act of remembrance that will cause us to set up more careful borders in our own lives that we don't go too far. Listen, borders are not just to keep things out. They're also to keep things in. And it's important that we as God's people have borders in our Christian lives that we purposely set up that I will not go past this. And I base those borders off of what God says in his word. Those are where my borders go up from. I get my building instructions from the word of God where to build it so that I don't drift off to a place where I'm going to either be divided or defiled or destroyed. Because oftentimes, once you get into that spot, I've seen it time and time again. And I know if I were to ask in here, how many people have seen someone who was a Christian, saved, born again Christian, get caught, caught up in the world and destroyed their lives? I'm sure I'd see about every hand go up. We all know somebody that has gone astray, that has gone that way. And so... Uh, that's important that we understand that. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we, we see a, a glimpse of this, of why we don't want these things to happen to us. Uh, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, Satan cannot destroy your salvation, and thank God for it. He can't touch that. All the demons in hell can't touch your salvation. You're there, you're sealed until the day of redemption. That means you're locked in. Otherwise, there would have been some questionability in that verse. They would have said, oh, well, he that can withstand with temptation and, and, and not go this way or not do this or not do that, then they'll, then they'll have their, their eternal life. Okay? Jesus made it very plain, but he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. So I believe f firmly and wholeheartedly 
that if there was ever a spot for me to be in question as if, if the devil could get my soul or if I could lose it any other way, uh, then, then Jesus would have told me. Because he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. So he, he didn't tell us that. All right, so that means that you're sealed unto the day of redemption. That's an unchangeability. You don't have any changeability there. That's when you are. You will be sealed until that day. And we already know that Jesus Christ himself is the only one worthy to loose a seal that he puts on. And so that's all through the scriptures. Now, Satan will use circumstances, but his main weapon uh, is the believer's flesh. We still have that old nature. It's depraved. The Apostle Paul is one of the greatest Christians uh, who ever lived outside of Christ. Says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for, I, for the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Listen, he had trouble in the flesh. We have trouble in the flesh. As much as we want to sit back and say, I wouldn't fall for that. No, but you might fall for something different. You might fall for something different. No, you might not be defiled because of drugs. You might not be defiled because of this or that or the other thing. But there is something that could defile you. We are not above our human tendencies. The more, oh, farther away from God you get, the farther away from Christianity that you get, farther into your own human desires and your humanity you get. You're sinking into that, which means you're going to be more prone to defile yourself in many different ways. Now, in the context of Romans 7, uh, 7, 18, we find the man of God not doing what he knew to do that was right, but often doing the things he knew would be wrong. Now, why? A question to be answered. Now, too often a believer suffers from self-indictment, not, not to our verses for this evening, but we find a simple one who was a youth. This was a man, a young man, the Bible says, void of understanding. Means he didn't have any understanding. And he was, he, obviously, he, he knew right where to go. Okay, this young man knew who the harlot was and where she lived. Now, these are ones of common knowledge. We would call it like the red light district or something like that. Uh, but he advanced from the street near her corner, and he went to the way to her house. He did so three times. He did it in the twilight, in the evening, and in the black, dark night. There were three chances to make a proper choice, and he failed to do so. Now it's nighttime. She's without. She's on the street. She lieth and wait at every corner. She caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. And here we need, no, no, need not go any further. But defilement. Defilement. I would dare to say that every adult uh, in here like that, like I mentioned before, could think of someone who's destroyed their testimony and usefulness through sinfulness. There's many that we that maybe some of us even had gone to church with for years, and, and they drifted away. Uh, they got out in the world. Their testimonies are permanently tarnished. Some men that have ruined their service because of their love for strange women. Some are men who went back to a life of alcohol and drugs, and many times, and, and a lot, oftentimes, Satan knows our weaknesses because we telegraph them. He's not omniscient. He cannot divide himself. Did you know that? Satan cannot because, uh, you know, even when they were talking about Jesus, uh, this man hath a devil and tells that the devils obey him because he has a devil. He said, can Satan cast out Satan? He can't. 
And that's that's in the that's in that same scripture uh, where he talks about a house divided cannot stand. Satan cannot divide himself. That's why he wanders to and fro on the earth. Otherwise, he would just be everywhere. If you're everywhere, you don't need to wander because you're everywhere. Right? If I'm everywhere, what need of movement have I? No, he's very active. Moving, seeking whom he may devour. He's wandering to and fro. And you know what he's looking for? He's kind of looking for some of those that are going to and fro. Ever wonder why the Bible says to be sound in doctrine? It says be sound because uh, not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Guess what? If the devil's going to and fro, and you're not biblically sound and you're going to and fro, you're on the same path he is. And eventually you will smack dab right in his face where he can destroy you at will. But if you're solid, you're stuck in the good doctrines, you're not going to and fro. You're going the opposite way of to and fro. You are planted you're not going anywhere. You're planted by the tree, by the waters and the life, and that you're, you're going to be growing and you're going to be maturing and you're going to be bearing fruit and you're going to be busy being productive. And you know what? The devil isn't looking for trees. The devil's looking for lost sheep. He's not looking for trees. The only, the, except maybe to lay under. I got a lot of animal plant experience. I got my PhD in animal planet. And you'll always find lions asleep under the trees. But he is not a lion. He is just acting like one. A lot of people like to say, oh, the devil's a lion. No, he's not. He's not. It says he, he does as a lion, as a lion, because a lion does go to and fro and looking for food, looking for prey. That's how he's behaving. Because if the devil, let's be honest, if the devil was a lion, he wouldn't be making much trouble because they sleep 20 hours a day. That means four hours of activity? Man, and the male lions are doing even less than that. Because it's all, he sends the girls out to bring down the prey. Then he comes charging in after his nap, ready to take the first cut. Man, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think those lionesses need to, to rise up and smack some sense into George and tell him to get up off. Get up off and go do something here. Help us out. Don't be laying there like that. You're just laying there all lazy. Man, if lionesses were like human wives, that, that he would never sleep. Uh, he'd be he'd be called he'd be called a lazy bum and all this stuff, and he'd be he'd be chastised to the point and vexed his spirit unto death to get up and go do something. That's that's just how that's just how it would be, but listen, it, it, we we all know these people. In these last perilous times, people are exposed to so many things that defile the mind and the body. In times past, most people lived in sin, remained out of the spotlight because their sin was not acceptable to people in general. But with the acceptable that all things are now good. Kind of culture, it's all out there and exposed. 
and people are proud to walk in sin. And I'm not picking on any one person, any one group. I'm talking about humanity in general. People are proud to walk in sin these days. And that's sad. We should never be comfortable in sin. The things that were once hidden are now broadcast on the housetops. Now, I just want to name a few things that you and I will face when we go out these doors into our Jerusalem that may defile us. First of all, there's the defilement of compromised situations. Satan will offer you opportunities for compromise. Now, we see in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Maybe it isn't evil, but it just looks that way. Stay away from it. This verse doesn't speak of evil, just its appearance. You know, I can appear, I can either appear to be godly or ungodly. Just in how I I, I dress. If I wanted to, I could go out, I could get tatted up, I could get, you know, uh, all the piercings. Uh, you know, all the different hair dyes, I can do uh, just whatever. You, 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 you can name anything. I can make you think that I was just flat out of the world and uh, by just by the way, I now does that mean I'm not saved because I look like that? No. It just means that I'm not giving fruits. Right? I, I'm not displaying. Think of the fig tree uh, that Jesus approached. It gave the appearance of bearing fruit. But when he got to it and he was hungry and there was nothing there, he cursed that tree and it died in that hour. Appearances. That gave an appearance of good, but there was nothing there. So did the Pharisees. Outwardly, they looked the part. But Jesus said, you're wooden sepulchers, you're... You're dead man's bones. You're all these different things. You're, you're rotted on the inside, even though you look the good part. So you could look the part and still be rotten, or you could look rotten and be good. That is called appearances. Okay? So that's what we're trying to abstain from, anything that appears to be evil. And what do we judge as evil? What can we say is evil? Well, that what God has said what's good. God has said what's evil. He's put it right out there for us. So all we have to do is if it doesn't look like God would put his stamp of approval on it, run. Okay? Because it gives off the appearance of that. And we can't connect to that because we're connected to God. So there's that. So we must have good conversation. That's your lifestyle that cannot be compromised. Titus 2, 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. So you must be above board with your testimony in order to stave off false accusations. Stay away from potentially compromised situation, something that could put you in jeopardy in your testimony. Secondly, the defilement of an uncontrolled tongue. This is hard for everybody, okay? This everybody, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are, you fit into this. We can all, the, the shoe fits everybody. This is a one-size-fits-all kind of category here because we all have tongues and they all sometimes are left in gear when our brain is idling. Okay? So Satan will cause you to say things that you'll later regret. The tongue is a fire in James 3, 6, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and, and is set on fire of hell. Listen, Remember what Jesus said. He said it wasn't what went into the man that 
defiles him. It's what comes out. Now, what is it that comes out that defiles us? Our words. Nothing else comes out that defiles us. What we chose to say, what we chose to speak, that is where, and it's uncontrolled, and it's let go, and it's just let her fly. Sometimes that let her fly could get you in trouble and defile you. Never, Like I said, never leave your tongue in gear when your brain's idling. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. Luke 6, 45, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. God gave you two ears, and he gave you one tongue. This should be a warning that that's all you need. Hear twice as much as you speak. You got an ear here, you got an ear here, you got one of them. Okay, majority rules, listen, then speak. We all have trouble with that sometimes. Because you know what, we're, we're busy people. We have made our lives very, very busy. So now when people come, when things come up, we're trying to jump to the conclusion before we've even heard anything else. All right, yeah, yeah, I heard you. Oh, but what about this? Okay, cool, great. We're already programming. We're not even really listening at this point. We've heard a little bit of information. Our brain is going, oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? You should say that. No, you shouldn't. Right? It's going all, it's going, it's going a mile a minute, and then all of a sudden you're already making a perceived, projective uh, solution before you've even heard even a quarter of what was being said. Guys, we're bad at that because we're solutionists by, solutionists by nature. You know, it's like we are built to try to solve problems. We want to solve your issue. And a lot of times, ladies, you want to come to us and you want to vent to us. You want to just be heard. You don't even want us to fix nothing. You just want the chance to get it off your chest. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if I was going to get any amen out of that. I'm thinking, man, I wish my wife was here. She'd give an amen. I do it too. Sometimes, and, and she's told me this, and I, and I know this, I've received wisdom uh, because of this, but it's like you want to just get it out and just let us, let's say, okay, well, this is a problem. This is a problem, and I'm sorry that this is making you feel this way. And so now, I, now I've tried to adopt the... Uh, I've tried to adopt the policy of trying to ask, is this something you want me to try to fix, or do you want me to shut up and listen? Because there's times then we just need to just shut up and listen and not, not try to you know give an answer when none is even wanted. Right? So... Think about that, and, and, and you know, I, I'm just trying to be a blessing to y'all, uh, men, for, for, for whatever you got left uh, going. These are, these are good things, but, you know, it took me a long time to learn that because we're trying to shut it down because I've got eight other million things that I'm trying to think about. You're coming to me, but in, in me doing that, I'm shutting you down. I'm shutting you down. I'm trying to say, okay, I just want to shut you up. Here's your solution. Now I've got to go on to thing 475. I was on fixing it, but you came with this. So now I had to fix this. Now I've got to go back to 475. Okay? But that, that's not how, not how we love. And God is showing me that. God's showing me more about how to love the way that I should. Because, you know, God doesn't just shut us down. He lets us get it all out. And he does fix things, but he fixes them because we ask him to. So if I'm going to be more like God, I guess I'm going to have to adapt that, that maybe 
you don't want my solution, you just want my ear and my attention and my focus and that I'm willing to walk away from 475 and spend the time with you, okay? Because that's how it should be. It should be that you're more important than 475. So guys, we gotta do better, step up our game, amen? And that's just, that's just good stuff right there. So Titus uh, 2.8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, uh, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Thirdly, the defilement of a bitter spirit. Oh my heavens, how we have seen this in the last days. I keep hearing uh, from, from other pastors and, uh, and preachers about people that, that are in their church that are fighting them, that have, that have evil spirit, and they just have a bitter spirit. And, and so there's always this conflict that's there. That is one of the ways that Satan will defile you is through that bitter spirit. He'll lead others to say and do things to hurt you and, and, and tempt you to react. Hebrews 12, 15, it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That bitterness it's got one end, and that is defilement of your body. It's going to defile you. The grace of God is sufficient to quench the bitterness. There's going to be things done to you you don't understand or that are not fair. People can be both wicked and hateful, and each of us have a choice to be made at this point. We can be bitter, or we can be better. Let's be better instead of bitter, because... I don't find anywhere, anywhere in the scripture where better defiles me. But I do find where bitter does. Because I'm not supposed to have any root of it. No root. Yank it all out of there. Like an eyebrow hair that's gone too crazy. Get him by the root. I, I laugh all the time because, like, I don't, I don't know what happens to, to a guy's body during, during the mid, middle part of his life and onward. We're just, you know, it, you just, it's just like, okay, do I need a weed whacker at this stage? I mean, well, what's going on? I, I'll, I'll be sitting there. I'll talk to Rachel. I'll tell you something funny. She ain't here. I'll be sitting there. I'll be talking to my wife. We'll be sitting on the couch or something, and she's staring, staring at it. She's not hearing a thing I have to say. Because her eye has locked in on an eyebrow hair that has gone astray. Or a gray hair that she happened to spot while I was talking. Reach up. Ah! You couldn't wait till I was finished. Sorry, it was disturbing me. I had to get it, honey. And praise the Lord. Thank you, wives, for doing all that gross stuff for us. We, we, don't, have the, we don't have the facilities to do it ourselves half the time. Like, no, no, you don't want to cut it. You got to pull it out by the root. That way it doesn't come back. Right? So there's things that you got to get by the root, and bitterness is one of them. It cannot be allowed to stay. It has to be uprooted. Matthew 5, 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for those which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this is a big one too. This is, fourthly, the defilement of fleshly allurement. Satan will place uh, someone, whether it's a woman or man, depending on who you are, in your life to entice you to commit adultery. And the way they do that is by getting you unsatisfied in your own relationships, in your own marriages, in your own relationships. 
something's going to be there and you automatically, oh, then somebody else comes along and just thinks you're the bee's knees. Well, I haven't felt like that in years. Somebody laughed at my joke. Somebody thinks I'm this or somebody thinks I'm that. The devil's using that to break you farther off, trying to pull you out of the covenant you made. Hey, flattery is, is just not good sometimes. Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is not just a man thing. Ladies should take extra care not to get too friendly with men other than their husbands. There's, there's so much interaction between men and women in our day because you know the lack of fidelity in marriages and closeness and workspaces. And I've witnessed this firsthand working at the warehouse when I was there and they, all the office people I'd see people that I knew were married in the offices all really flirting it up in the offices with, with the others that are, that are up there. And a lot of infidelity went on. Those that were married in here that were actually drawn away to somebody out there and, and, having an, uh, and not having a good relationship. I've seen that firsthand thinking, well, why would you do that? You're married. You said, I do. That means I choose you over anybody I've ever met and anybody I ever could meet. You are the one I want. Where'd that go? Well, maybe you need to learn better jokes. Maybe you better do something more with yourself. Maybe you ought to be more lovable. There's a lot of reasons why things change in a relationship. And guys, it's not all her fault. We change. It's a part of life. So sometimes you just got to get back to what you first did. Just like, uh, just like Pastor Ron was talking about, getting back to our first love. Getting back to the things that were important. Why they were important. Do you remember why it was important? Do you remember why? You couldn't stop thinking about them. Do you remember why she was everything to you and you couldn't wait to be together? Getting back to those kinds of things. Because you know what happens? It, what happens, and I'm not turning this into a marriage, marriage counseling course, but what happens is over time, due to circumstances, due to conflicts, due to whether there's you know conflicts with each other over situations where you decided to go against each other instead of join together to fix the problem and attack the problem, you know things happen and that starts getting our mind off of why we were there in the first place. So we need to remember why we were there in the first place. And I have to also bring this into a spiritual aspect, and I would be amiss if I did not. But we as God's people, I don't care if you've been saved for 10 minutes or you've been saved for 60 years, you better remember what, why you're there in the first place. If we can get back to remembering why we're here in the first place, because of him, because of what he did, because of the sin we don't have, because of the hell and the lake of fire that we'll never have to endure, it would help us get back to our first love. That love that we had at the beginning. So we have to be careful. There's the defilement of fornication, of course. Uh, there's, Satan's certainly going to compromise the purity of the youth uh, in the area of in, uh, sexual impurity. I'm not going to hang out there, but we all know that's out there. Also, there is the defilement of sinful habits. Satan has made sinful habits both appealing and easily accessible. 1 Corinthians 3.17, if any man defile the temple of God... 
him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So one good rule of thumb that I heard is to never start something that you're going to have to quit. Never start. And, and, and with that, I, you can throw a whole host of things in there, uh, whether it be... Uh, whether it be smoking or cursing or drinking or drugs, pornography, whatever it is, don't start doing it. Never start doing it if you are going to need to quit later. Make that a rule. Don't start something. Because our we're bought with a price. Our body is not our own. Our body is the temple of God. It, it, it we're to glorify God in our body, in our spirit, or God's. There's the defilement of evil thinking. Mark 7, 20 through 23, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolish. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's, that's our thinking is the, mo the number one reason why we get defiled. It's our thinking going right back to what our mind and what we should be thinking about. 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober to the hope to the end for the, Christ, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Titus 1.15, Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Can you imagine that? You want to know why people don't uh, why people don't act right with a good conscience? It's because their body and their conscience is defiled. Once your conscience is defiled, it will only speak that which is defiling. It will never give you good advice anymore. You'll never have good, good moral compass with a defiled conscience. And some people go so far and have gone so far away from God's call that the Bible says that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now, when that is seared, that is something that you cannot take back. One thing I love is to get a good sear on a steak. Amen right there? You got to have it. Seals in, locks off all that flavor, but you have raw meat that can, you know, everything's just passing through, it's just raw, and then all of a sudden, you get a pan ripping hot, you get that seasoning on there, and you lay away, please, lay away from you so it doesn't splash on you, you let that just burn, and you let all that, and it locks it in, it sears it, but you know what, what if I go, oh, I forgot a spice. I meant to put this on there instead. When I pull that out of the pan, that is seared, that is cooked. That cannot be changed, however so much I want it to be. I can no longer take that and make it into a raw substance that would, uh, that would, that would pull in what I'm trying to put in. Now, you could do it to the other side. Okay, in fairness to cooking, you could do it to the other side. But the point is, is once you sear that, it changes the texture. It locks it in, and it's not changeable. So when somebody's defiled conscience gets to the point where it's seared with a hot iron, it will be un changeable. God can take stony places out of our heart all day long. He can give us a heart of flesh. When our conscience is seared, it's locked in. That's dangerous. 
dangerous. I, I would definitely want to uh, leave you with just a couple things here before we get into our prayer request time. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you might ask, how do I keep myself from both physical, uh, uh, spiritual and physical defilement? And I'll leave you with this. And it's, uh, it's the protection of a purposed heart. You have to purpose your heart. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 has this to say. And just let this, let this marinate all over you today. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He set a boundary up that said, this is where I don't go. We've come to that spot where I can't go where you're going. As a Christian, you're going to get there. You're going to have people in your life that are going to take you to the edge of your border. That's their, that's, that's, they, unknowingly, that's what they do. They are taking you to your own border and saying, oh, it's all right. Just come on. Let's just walk together. Oh, just a little bit further. Just a little bit further. Just a little bit further. When you get to that place where you have purposed in your heart that you're not going to go any further towards defiling yourself, you have to make a choice now. Because can two walk except they be agreed? I'm sorry. I've enjoyed our friendship up to this point. I've enjoyed hanging out with you, but you're going somewhere I can't go. And you're also going someplace that I will not go. I cannot, I will not go any further because this is the end for me. This is where I draw the line this is where I will told God I will not cross. If you continue to go this way, I wish you all the best, but I cannot go with you. You have to purpose in your heart not to defile yourself because that is one of Satan's devices that I would not have you to be ignorant of, brethren. But understanding that's his purpose is to divide you in your thought, in your actions, to defile you and ruin your testimony, and ultimately to destroy you, your influence, and your usefulness for God. You can stop it. You can stop him because the Bible tells us that if we submit ourselves therefore unto God and resist the devil, that means pull away. When someone is resisting arrest, they're not going easy. They're fighting. They're pulling in the opposite direction. They're trying to break free. That's what we got to do. All right, that's all I have for you for that. Let's get into our prayer request time. And let me see.